Can you please tell us your name? Um, I'm Kamal Hussein. So, yes, I'm Kamal Hussein. I live there in Isle of Dogs or Canary Walk. Um, yes, I'm a single man, 46 years old. Um, well, then four. tell us a bit more about <laughs> yes. your background. And so, were you born here? Were your parents born here? And what was it, what was it like early on in your life? So, um, I, I, I feel like, you know, I am probably one of the first gener or maybe the first generation of Bangladeshis to grow up in East End of London. I was born in, uh, yeah, in my Hospital in 1974, and my grandfather came to the England. Um, the story as it goes, my grandfather came to, uh, he, he was dropped at Liverpool. He used to work for a Royal Navy or the boat or a ship. Nobody knows the exact the, you know, details, but he was dropped in Liverpool. He worked for a number of years, um, and then he moved to Birmingham, and then he went back to Bangladesh, and at the time of partition, he wasn't very happy, you know, where he grew up with all the Hindu children, you know, there, there was a partition and the Bangladesh wasn't the same. So he decided to um, move back to Birmingham. And uh, so they started a life in Birmingham and sometime my father moved to London and, uh, you know, we grew up in uh, Actually, I know the address, number 12 Spelman Street. Um, that's where, you know, me and my brothers and sisters were born. And ever since, uh, you know, I grew up in, in the East End. Um, I went to, my primary school was Ben Johnson, which was, um, it's near my land. My secondary school was Stepney Green. When I was growing up in Stepney Green, um, I was in my class, I was probably, there was only four other ethnic kids so yeah the, the whole of east end has changed i remember you know the canary walk didn't even exist so we moved around a bit so we grew up in um, Ste um brick lane stepney mile End. then briefly we moved to east town for a bit and then we moved back to isle of dogs um and that's where i, I grew up all my college you know i went to Tarambis college um, the, the secondary school, uh, Stepney Green, last two, GC, two years of GCSE, I went to Stepney Green. How many brothers and sisters do you have? So I have uh, one sister and three brothers. So altogether, there's five of us. Okay. So yeah. um, so what was the like? So you, you, you grew up in the East End, you studied in the East End, um, and as time progressed, Oh, um, how do you know whether you, you want to study certain things or did you study? What subject do you study? Hmm. Uh, well, you know, the, the time we were, I was growing up, universities were for the privileged few. So um, the year I sort of completed my college, that's the year when Tony Blair won the election for the Labour Party. 1996, 97, okay. And they announced, or like, yeah, or something like that, or just before that, the government, you know, the Labour government brought in um, where everybody was allowed to go to university. So that's given me, an, you know, a chance to go to university. You know, there was like no tuition fees. Uh, well, actually, tuition fees was paid by the government. So that allowed me and several other Bengali kids and community to go to university um, with with that with the Labour government scheme. So I went to Greenwich University, and I did a business management uh, degree there. And then following on from that, you know, I actually decided um, I, did, I did not want to work <laughs> in a restaurant, and I did not want to open up a shop because that was that was the ambition of um, young kids at the time. You know, we grow up, we'll open a restaurant, we'll open a restaurant, or we'll open a local uh, grocery shop. So, you know, that was the kind of like um, ambition at the time because kids didn't really have any guidance from their parents to actually aim for higher careers because that was only for the privileged few. And also East End, it's not just like, you know, the Bengalis. You also had the white East End community and, um, you know, they also didn't have, let's say, the upper hand on the basis that, you know, like um, the, the way the society was just before the 70s and 80s, it was a very hierarchical society, British society. So the working class um, shall I say white English or the Irish English were lumped in the East End of London with all the Bengali community and all the immigrant community. So yes, when I was growing up, there was a lot of racial tension. I remember there was a big, uh, th there's actually a park named after him, 
on Tabali Park. Um, so there was a massive racial riot, and I still remember this. Um, in Isle of Dogs, the British National Party won the election. And, you know, like to touch on some of the serious stuff, you know, growing up wasn't easy, you know, like, so obviously, you know, we were torn between almost like three different cultures. Um, first, you know, you had your mom and dad's Bengali culture, you know, where they were forcing you to learn Arabic, you know, study Bengali, send you to, you know, Sunday school, Saturday school. And then you were like torn between, you know, growing up in England with, you know, all your English culture. And then you had all the other different types of activities going on in your life that you, you know, you want to, you know, you know, make everybody happy, you know, make the society happy, make the family happy, make um, your friends, you know, you had like different sets of friends whereby, you know, you had your Bengali friends, you had your English friends, and, you know, you had to adapt and change to different uh, circumstances. And that, I guess, you know, when I look back on it now, it actually made, you know, probably made us better people because, you know, we've learned both cultures and that has given us the ability to think or look at something in two different ways. While, you know, if you were born as an English person, for example, you know, you will only be taught the English way. So that gave us sort of like the upper hand of, you know, analyzing and, you know, thinking of or seeing things in a different perspective rather than just one narrow tunnel, tunnel vision. But how would you say, uh, let's say, formal education has, has helped you? So formal education opened up a lot of doors. So again, so when I graduated from university, um, I actually deliberately said I do not want to work in a restaurant and I do not want to open up my own grocery store. So I, you know, I thought, okay, I need to start working for an investment bank and because that's where the money was, that's where the prestige was. So at the time, it was very difficult to work in um, investment banks or hedge funds because you have to know someone. And when you know someone, they'll, you know, they'll bring you in. That was the way the you know the whole system op operated back in the day however um i decided to go go through a different route so i tried to work for the regulator the financial regulator and i thought if i go into regulation and then from regulation you know you start supervising some of the banks and hedge funds start building connection and then go into investment banking so i start i started my career with the regulator and then i moved on to investment banking and now i work in asset management in uh, hedge funds so what will be your job title then? my job title is a risk manager or a compliance uh, a compliance officer risk manager okay. yeah. and what does that entail so that entails two things from the compliance side you know you look at you know that the firm is complying or following all the rules and regulations that are set in, in the financial services sector for the specific like asset class or like um, or, or, or a business type. So and that's the compliance side of things. And the risk side of things is like looking at all the risks that the investment manager will face and finding either, you know, you, some risk mitigation plan on how to mitigate those risks. COVID is a really good example. So the company I work for, before COVID, uh, as a risk manager, we had to set up the business continuity planning and disaster recovery planning. What does that so mean? What's in practice? So what that basically means is that if the business if the business is shut down or if there's a bomb, say, and it blew up the whole business, how will you operate the business without the office, without the presence? So th that plan has to be executed. So we've drafted that long before. So as soon as COVID happened, you know, we were just applying this, but everybody goes home, everybody logs from home, everybody does a Zoom <laughs> phone. So it's all, you know, we locked the offices, we've taken all the um, laptops and, you know, everyone's taken them home and the equipments that are in the office are securely locked and uh, password protected and all the rest. Well, we kind of moved straight to obviously COVID, but let's go back a bit. I mean, mm. tell me, uh, obviously, work where you covered what it was like in a sense of ways mm -hmm. to prepare and to minimise damage in t in terms of risk prior to COVID in the context of your work. What was it like also personally prior to COVID? Um, yeah. Prior, prior to COVID, you know, the life was, um, you know, normal as one can expect. You know, you can go to your restaurants, you can go meet up with your friends, you can take the tube, you can take the bus, you can jump on an Uber. So the whole human interaction, you know, 
was there and it was very important because you know now everybody realizes that if, even though we're FaceTime and Zooming it's not the same as physically meeting someone you know I was able to go to the gym and have a workout on a stressful day so those things that we little things that we've taken for granted all of a sudden it's just wiped off so the first few weeks was almost like an excitement for everyone oh we're going to, everyone's going to work from home you know sad to say this but it almost felt like oh there's a it's a fun activity you know let's everybody go home um, you know obviously not the covid itself but actually the whole adjustment on working life was kind of excitement and fun but little did we realize that actually you know after a few more weeks people are going to get bored and whether you know you like it or not quarantine is meant to be for ill person people who are ill it's quarantine is not for healthy people so we are in a situation right now where healthy people are being quarantined in their own homes where they're not actually ill because of the people who might be at risk so that is something that you know like obviously i i guess everybody needs to think about like you know this whole quarantine you know how do we deal with this quarantine now you know especially with this you know sorry to say this this incompetent government who doesn't even know what they're doing you know well actually let me take that back i think the government actually knows what they're doing they're very intelligent but they're not telling the public or they're really dumb it's either or i'd like to think you know the government is not hiding anything from the people mm-hmm. Um, but if they are, then obviously there might be something bigger. There's something bigger happening behind the scenes, and mm. the stuff that we get is only from the media, and which is controlled by the government anyway. Or the government is dumb. And if the government, the issue I have with the government right now mm. is like, there's no clear description of how long are you expecting a healthy person to be quarantined inside their home. So people need hope. And this government does not give people any hope. In fact, Donald Trump is actually doing better than him. At least he, he turns up in the meet. How many times have you seen your government's leadership? The, this leader should be attending every day, making announcements. You know, he comes like he came last Sunday, gave us a I don't know what he said, you know, either you go to work, you don't go to work, um, you step outside, you step inside, you know. So he gave us a really vague message and Nobody's ever heard of, heard of him since then. Like, you know, he just went into uh, hibernation. So that's, that, that is tough for me in terms of, like, not knowing what the hell is going on, you know, you know, for some people to visualize how long we need to do this. You know, if you put someone on a treadmill and say, run, you know, pe- people can't run, they'll get bored. But if you tell people you'll have to run for 15 minutes, there is a target, and they'll, you know, after five minutes, they say, oh, I can't do it anymore, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall off the treadmill. But at least they knew they fell off the treadmill after five minutes. So has that impacted your work in any way whatsoever? Yes. Productivity is low. It started off good. But now people are becoming lazier. Tell me more about you. How do you feel about it? It's about your experience. So the way I feel about it, so for me, work-wise, I actually don't like working from home and it's been imposed on me. Because home was my little safe space. Yeah. Home was my little temple. You know, after work, I come home and I relax. I can't separate the two now. You know, like, you know, every time I come in the kitchen and I look at the laptop and the computer, I'm like, oh, God, it just reminds me of the office. You know, I am not relaxed in my own home. You know, I keep on looking at the computer every five minutes, every five minutes. The positive side of this, you know, obviously we don't have to do the commute. Um, obviously, we're finding ways to work from home. Um, there's no need to go in the office. You know, the commuting time, it, it, it is stressful. And, you know, especially with the journey with London Underground, you know, that makes a huge... So um, where, so you problem. live, am I right? You, st- you live in North Docklands now? Canary Wharf. So Canary then f- how far is it from where you work? Um, and I work in the city. I okay. work in, um, yeah, in Bank uh, okay. Monument. Uh, also, um, health-wise, I think the negative impact that I'm having... Where I would normally go to gym once, uh, you know, what, uh, hour a day. But on top of that, I will probably have a physical activity, as in like the physical movement, for about um, two hours per day. And I'm not doing that by being at home. To give you an example, it will probably take me half an hour to walk up and down the station to get to the office and half an hour back, up and, you know, walking. So that, that mobility is actually burning calories. So I'm not doing that at the moment. Then when you're in the office, you're running up and down in the meeting room, so you're constantly moving around. 
Now, I'm not even literally sitting on this sofa, on this chair, or I'm lying on the sofa. So the mobility and the health-wise, so I'm not getting that extra two hours of, um, you know, cardio burning I would normally do from walking around or even going out, popping out to get some lunch. So mentally, how has that impacted you? First of all, boredom, you know, like boredom. Uh, physically, I'm starting to put on weight. <laughs> 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 I actually started to put on weight, you know, funnily enough. And uh, mentally, and I think the, the mental issue is not because I'm quite a sound mental, you know, like sound person. I'm very structured, so I have a routine every day. So there was a, there was a brief moment, a week, where I was literally having a nervous breakdown, thinking I can't do this. You know, I can't do this for a, a, any longer. I need to get out the house. I need to meet friends. I need to meet family. Oh, and obviously, friends and family, nobody wanted to meet because they're self isolating themselves. So I used to go out for a walk, then come back home, and then it was literally like, how long is this going to last? So the boredom and the mental issue um, was really getting to me, like being at home and not knowing what to do. And it, it almost almost felt like if you were in a prison in your own home. Yes, you know, the argument is, oh, but you can go out for a walk and you can go out uh, for to the supermarket, but it's not the same. You know, even if you go to the supermarket, it'd be... To be honest, you know, like I've never, I get really excited to go to supermarket nowadays, and which I never did. I used to hate supermarket. Now I actually like going to supermarket because I get to see people. <laughs> and also, um, yeah, so the he- mental health wise, you know, this is very important, especially with the Bengali people, you know. Bengali people, culturally, they are very social people, like a brother will go and see their sister, a sister will check up on their brother to make sure everything is going well. If you don't, then it's almost like a frowned upon if you don't contact your brother and sister for a week or it's a cultural thing, you need to check up, you need to show sign of respect. And I think that is going to be very hard for a lot of Bengali people to be locked and trapped in the house where, you know, especially when they are such a free, free moving people, shall I say. That's how Bengali people are. They love to go out. They love to meet their cousins and friends. They can't sit in front of the television for too long. Um, so mentally, I don't know how these people are coping, considering I had a really tough spell just being at home. Literally, like, imagine somebody says, sit on the chair for 10 hours, and you just want to scream and get out and start mm-hmm. screaming. I, I need to get out of the chair. That's how I felt. I need to get out of this house and do something, but I don't know what. Like, you know, that's... And I realized what the missing part is this human interaction. You know, meeting someone face to face, you know, like shaking hands or giving a hug to my little niece. You know, these are the things you can't compare with the, the digital interaction. So do you live by yourself? or? Yeah, I live by myself. Well, obviously, that, naturally, that makes it even more difficult. Come on, that's inevitable, yeah, for God's sake. that makes it more difficult. But on the flip side, I have yeah. friends and family or some of my family, you know, they're yeah. living at with parents and that's having a reverse impact on them is driving them literally after all they're arguing they're bickering they're fighting they can't wait for the COVID to be over so they can move out you know so there's a there's a flip side to this so this is going to create mental issues or yeah. um, social issues as well <clears throat> and to give you another example I have two friends who actually who who flat share and usually they would they would hardly see each other because you know, they do their shifts and they come one would come home in the evening and you'll just have a few hours in the evening and Saturday Sunday they normally would do their own things you know but they live in the same house they're flat sharing and they loved each other you know they were like best flatmates ever and now since they've been living together they're actually the cracks start to show. Do you feel um, you've heard or seen any kind of like problems that COVID may have created? In, in the Bengali community, have you seen many deaths? Have you heard of uh, any people going to hospital? Any of those things? Yes. So one of the you know like one of the issues I have actually, um, and this is a, something that I've experienced so many times. I get I see quite a few Bengali kids, uh, probably just under sixteen. Uh, they all kind of gather around and hang around together, and um, you know they're either smoking or having long conversations. When I see this, it really concerns me. I'm like, oh god. Obviously, the parents and family don't know. They probably think the son's just gone for a walk. Um, but they're actually um, mingling with other youths. And uh, this is something that you know they should be really careful of. Um, in terms of death, um, 
I haven't had any death, but one of my aunts caught COVID when she visited a hospital for her cancer appointment. She went back to the hospital. They said they're not going to give her air vents. Apparently, it's only for people with a you know survival rate. She doesn't put, tick the boxes because she was over 80. She had cancer. Um, so they were not going to give her the uh, venti air ventilation. That really made us angry. It almost felt like the government has already decided the list of people that should die from this. It wasn't like first come, first serve. If, you know, and considering like the so considering like you know the Nightingale uh, Hospital was completely empty anyway. Hospital said, you know, they're not going to transfer her there. So um, we had a big fight with the. Um, with the hospital staff and finally they managed to give her a vent at the breathing machine and um so her, uh, don't quote me exact numbers on this but it's something like twelve thousand liters or something like that of oxygen and then on the machine and then it went down to 10 8 and now she's on two and they're going to release her um maybe day after you know she's fine now so from this experience personally what did you kind of pick up on? What did you learn for yourself? Did, did, did you learn more about yourself in the process? Yes, I think for me, it was about... So, I used to spend a lot of money unnecessarily. I realised I'm a such a good cook and I should be cooking more often. So I'm cooking a lot indoors. Obviously, you have to cook a lot. Um, yeah, and I think it just gives you a reflection of how life, you know, no matter how much money you have, you know, you could be a billionaire, millionaire, um, you know, money's not everything. You know, if, if, the, if, if all the supermarkets are shut and you can't find your basic to toilet roll, you know, money doesn't do anything. It's about like, you know, what can you give to the society? What can you do to make the society a better place so everyone can help each other? Um, yeah, so it's ref on reflection, just thinking of things I would do personally differently. I would cook a lot and indoors. Mm -hmm. I will invite my friends around once this is over more often, so I get to see them because I really miss my friends and family. Yeah. So, so many. And do you think there's been any changes uh, also in terms of behaviour due to Ramadan at all? Yeah. So Ramadan, on one one hand, it's easier because you know the, those people who had to go to work, for example, are now furloughed and staying home. Um, so it's easier for them just to stay home and just. But like, do you uh, fast? Do you fast? Yes, yes, I do fast. Um, so what was it like for you? Hmm? Well, what was it like so for you? So I, I, I kept first. I always keep like the first few just to get get. It. For me, um, it's not about. It's more about the tradition and keeping the Bengali culture. So I always keep the first five to seven fast, and then in between I just do it like for um, health reason or just so you know if I, you know or, you know obviously for rather than as well. And also, if I, if my, you know, if I'm going for, for this year, I haven't been round yet for Iftari. But if I go to Iftari someone's house, and I'll fast the, the day before, knowing that I'll have to go for Iftari. So yes, yeah, so I do fast. I should fast every single day, but you know, sometimes it's quite hard. And you know, yeah, for me, like being at home, it's easy to fast. And when I'm in the office, because when you're in the office, and um, you know, you you need food and energy to think. You know, when you're in a meeting and somebody's asking really technical questions, you know, you need to be able to answer those questions quickly. Um, and I found that, you know, if, I'm, if I don't eat, if I'm hungry, you know, I can't think. And also, like, you know, health reasons, you know, like, a, you know, we, if you look at the Bengali community, in Bangladesh, you know, people were not supposed to binge eat. In Bangladesh, you know, there was literally, like, you have your breakfast or, you know, maybe two, you know, the rich people would have three times a day meal and there's no snacks in between normally in Bangladesh. This whole Western culture of binge eating, you know, you have a coffee, you have a drink, you have a biscuit, you have a cake on someone's birthday. Um, and also, like, in this world, Western culture, we're losing our way. We are supposed to have a feeling called hunger. And that's the feeling that everyone should be having daily. I mean, just kind of briefly, kind of going back to work, what, I, have you been furloughed or any of those things? Or is it all fine? So, no, I haven't been furloughed. Um, uh, so I've been made redundant because the company, um, you know, like for, com for small companies, it's easier to make people redundant than furloughed. Um, 
yes, yeah, so a lot of the small companies are making people redundant rather than furlough because it's easy. Is it due to COVID? Due to COVID, yeah. So, so what happened? Gone. So you know, so this whole thing you read on the news that uh, um, companies should furlough, should not make people redundant. It's not. It's not the real fact. If you look at the actual statistics. Companies are making people redundant because it's easy for them to make redundant. Furlough is an additional cost. So, so how does that make you feel? So yeah, it was t it was tough, but luckily I'm one of those people. You know, I always like to have savings for rainy days. So again, you know, I've, I'm I'm okay for at least up until December, and then after December, I really would go into a panic mood, thinking, okay, what do I do now if I can't get a job? So that's why in this current market, I'm a little bit like worried, you know, when will it pick up? When will the jobs, you know, start to pick up? When will companies start recruiting? Um, you know, and I'm not the only one. I've got another two more friends who've been made redundant as well. So obviously we are he hearing on the news of this wonderful furlough scheme by the Tory government, but actually nobody talks about, nobody actually asked the government how many people have been made redundant as a result of that. But if you look at the unemployment figure, that will tell you how many people have been made, um, made uh, redundant. So then you can say, actually, government is talking about furlough, but if everybody's been furloughed, how come do we have the highest unemployment figure since record began? And I think what's coming to the government, there's going to be a mass rioting, um, there's going to be a social uh, you know, unrest, uh, there will be civil disobedience, uh, because the government is not handling this situation very well. And the reason why the government is not handling the situation very well is because uh, the government is so focused on pleasing the economy. So then who, who do you blame for your redundancy? So I blame, uh, obviously, you know, you can't blame the firm itself. The company mm. has to make, you know, people redundant because they, the company needs to survive. Yeah. So you can't blame the company and, the, you know, what they, you know, this is something that they have to do. Um, the, what I blame, obviously, you know, the COVID is, is to blame, but I actually blame the government for handling this situation really poorly because, you know, like we wasted almost like two months deciding, should we do yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So the World Health Organization from 15th of November told the world there is a pandemic, there is an epidemic in China which can turn into pandemic. At that point in November, the government should have stopped all the flights from China. January, it started to hit Italy. February, we started to get in Spain. And in March, the 20 or 19th of March or something, the British government decided to have a lockdown. So would you say now the way things are, future is looking very, very bleak? Bleak, absolutely. I think what you what you'll notice at the moment, people are obviously locked down indoors, and I think this this is the government interest to keep. If they can keep the people indoors as long as they possible, there will be less. You know, there will not be any social disturbance. The system that you know it's so shambolic that it doesn't work, and people really need to start. Um, you know, there will be a repercussion. There will be social unrest. And to give you an example of that man with four kids and no money, no job, you know, how does he feed his kids? You know, so he has every right to actually start looting and uh, going to supermarkets and taking food. I'll, in fact, I will support him if he needs to do that. People need to support the vulnerable. If that's what, you know, if the government doesn't provide help, let them go in and let them rip the corporations. You know, I believe in that. Even though I work in a capitalist, you know, I work in investment banking, you know, like in a capitalist environment, but this again and again proves that socialism is the way. So that's why um, this government has a rude awakening very soon. Well, Kamal, on that note, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much.